Is that Don Tate? That's <laughs> why I never read memos because I hate wearing bow ties. No, Stacy is not one of them. It's pretty cool. There they are. There they are. Yeah. Bronze. Forever. Forever, yeah. Or, well, <laughs> well, we presume. By this government, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a little while. For a little while. For a little while. <laughs> Welcome to the Corinth Civil War Interpretive Center, unit of the Shiloh National Military Park. Uh, my name is Bjorn Skaptison, and I'm a park volunteer, and I'm going to lead lead this program today. Uh, now, this program is uh, uh, it's going to be the last program of the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Shiloh. And I thank you all for carving some time out of your schedule to come down here and be part of it. Um, and uh, we will certainly be here next year doing something, uh, doing the same thing or something similar. Not the same thing, different programs. Uh, we always do different programs each year. But the idea is to interpret the Battle of Shiloh on the ground it happened, uh, on the date of the activity, and around the time that it happened. And bring in, uh, and the park, the park Service brings in historians that can give you uh, detailed, detailed interpretation, uh, quite often new interpretation, challenging interpretation, interpretation that challenges previous stories and so on. Uh, and so coming to the anniversary hikes is well worth your time. Uh, as opposed to simply coming out and visiting the park on any of the other 364 uh, days of the year. Uh, so, but nevertheless, it, it's, it's going to be worth your time, and it's always worth your time to come at any time. Now we are in Corinth, and there's an exception, because it's not the date uh, of the action, and it is uh, not necessarily the time of the action, uh, but it is part of the story of the Battle of Shiloh. It is part of the Battle of Shiloh. So we're going to do an interpretive drive and walk today that will interpret uh, a part of the battlefield of the siege and campaign for Corinth, Mississippi. Now, the Battle of Shiloh was the battle for Corinth. Perhaps we don't say that often enough, perhaps we say it too often, but you can't say it, I don't think you can say it too often. The Battle of Shiloh was the battle for Corinth. Corinth is that great intersection of railroad lines. Uh, uh, two of the most important uh, railroad lines in the south crossed here Corinth, Mississippi, the Memphis and Charleston Railroad uh, passed over this land, uh, right over there, and the uh, Mobile and Ohio Railroad passed over this land. And those two major rail lines in the south crossed each other here in Corinth, Mississippi. And since the southern part of the U.S. that uh, was uh, during the time of the Civil War, the Confederacy uh, had a dearth of infrastructure, had a dearth of railroads. And therefore, if two railroads were interdicted by the other side, it would create uh, enormous problems for the Confederate war effort. Uh, by contrast, uh, the, uh, uh, the north, the northern states were already thoroughly stitched uh, with railroads, north, south, east, west, trunk lines, uh, uh, everything else, all, all over the place. People in the north were already jumping on railroads and commuting back and forth and going, going one place or another. Uh, internal improvements had been a political, a political uh, goal of the Whig Party in the decades prior to the Civil War and uh, the Whig Party had a great deal of, uh, a great deal more success politically in the North, in the antebellum North, than uh, in the antebellum South. Uh, the 
Democrat Party being uh, having a pretty firm grip on power in the South. And uh, they were less amenable to the concept of internal improvements. So we had these two major railroads across, and the goal of the operation of General Grant's army was to capture that crossroads. Indeed, there's a, a, a somewhat dramatic scene that played out in St. Louis uh, in January. Around January of 1862, General William T. Sherman, having recently returned to duty after having been declared insane <laughs> by the press, uh, and, lo and losing his job as the commander in Kentucky uh, had taken leave of absence and after having taken leave of absence needed a job, any job that anybody could get him and his old colleague from uh, California, uh, officer he served with in California during the U.S.-Mexico War, Henry Wager Halleck happened to be in charge uh, of the Union operations in the West with the headquarters in St. Louis. So Halleck said, yeah, Sherman, you can come and work for me. And he sent Sherman off on an inspection tour around, uh, around Missouri. But Sherman found himself back in St. Louis at Halleck's headquarters in January of 1862 and had a, had a chance to stay, sit and uh, go into Halleck's office and talk about strategic planning for the upcoming campaigns and went into Halleck's office and Halleck had a map of the Mississippi Valley laid out on the table there, and uh, Halleck says to Sherman, Sherman, can you, tell, can you tell me what you think is the, is the true objective, uh, what is the true line of operations for our upcoming, uh, for our upcoming strategy, for upcoming strategy, and uh, a bit of a challenge, you know, and so Sherman looks at the map and then he reaches over, and instead of putting his finger on the Mississippi River, somewhere like Memphis, he puts his finger on Corinth, Corinth, Mississippi, where the two railroads cross. And Halleck says, yes, that's just what I was thinking. <laughs> 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 it's like you agree with me. Uh, the, uh, right there, and, and it, I think it's important to, to uh, parse out a little bit what uh, uh, Halleck meant when he said, what is the true line of operations? Uh, because what he was referring to, uh, when he says true line of operations, he's referring to a, a phrase that's used in fencing, in sword fighting. Uh, there is a, uh, you, you, in sword fight, fencers either have a true thrust, which is attacking the enemy, or a false play, which is a feint of some sort. And, uh, and generally speaking, amongst military planners, uh, the false play while tempting, uh, they generally understood it to be the wrong choice. Under the principle, they didn't call it that then, but we do now, and the principle of keep it stupid, keep it simple, stupid, kiss planning, um, the, you know, don't bother with feints. Go and hit the enemy at his weakest point, at his most vulnerable point, and when you go, go straight in. And, uh, so, uh, so Halleck was convinced, you know, that he had found the true line of attack, which meant they would not attack, they would not attack it down, attack down the Mississippi River. They would get together with the Navy and attack up the Tennessee River, whereupon they would cross 22 miles of landscape here and cut the Confederate railroads at Corinth. Uh, so that's the grand strategy that brings us to the Siege of Corinth. Um, now, the battle for Corinth was not fought at Corinth. Uh, based on the decision of Albert Sidney Johnson, the commander of the Confederate Army here at Corinth, they marched up to try to destroy General Grant's army at Pittsburgh Landing before they could be reinforced by General Don Carlos Buell's army. So there at Shiloh, the battle for Corinth took place. And the Confederates lost that battle. And so Beauregard brought his army back here to Corinth and began constructing uh, an enormous line of earthworks, an enormous line of earthworks to make Corinth into a fortress. And that uh, if the Federals came down, 
Uh, now that they had not been beaten at Pittsburgh Landing, if the Federals came down here, they would have, they would be stopped at this fortress. Uh, and indeed, maybe they would find themselves out on the far end of a long line of communications and supply, and perhaps by being, uh, by being besieged, Beauregard could yet starve the enemy out. Uh, it's rather a Quixotic uh, wish if he was going for that, uh, but he had to do something to protect this railroad crossroads, and indeed he had a significant army to do it. And so for one month after the Battle of Shiloh, while the Union armies were recovering and reorganizing from the damage done at the Battle of Shiloh, uh, General Beauregard recruited and reorganized his army here at Corinth while building an enormous network of earthworks to protect the city. Uh, now, one of the uh, one of the Union generals, the Union general that gave the name to this program that we're going to use today, uh, was not alive by the time this actually happened. And his name was General Charles Smith. General Charles Smith, that was for a brief time the uh, commander of the Union Army on uh, the Tennessee River. Uh, and, but he injured his leg. He was replaced by General U.S. Grant, who had previously commanded the Army in Halleck, and nobody, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lincoln said, whatever, <laughs> whatever that guy's drinking, send <laughs> some to all the rest of my generals. <laughs> that was that little episode with Halleck thinking that Grant was drinking, so he put Smith in charge. Nevertheless, Smith, Smith has a great quote. He said, um, if he did, Smith did not think that Johnston would leave Corinth to fight outside of his earthworks. He went to fight it at Shiloh. And uh, when posed with that question, uh, Smith repeated, uh, you will not be able to, uh, you know, if you want to get these Confederates, you're going to have to go down to Corinth and dig them out as you would dig a badger out of its hole. Uh, now we have a, a fairly uh, hefty, yeah, we have a fairly hefty percentage of badgers uh, on this particular program. Uh, and my so, great grandfather was one. Yeah, and your great grandfather was a badger, a Wisconsin badger. He lived on a hill. But that was the idea, and 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 this uh, program we hope to illustrate that General Smith was right. Uh, this the capture of Corinth will not occur, would not occur because of some large, decisive, maybe bloody, one-day battle where the armies would come together and they would fight and one would be defeated and then the prize would fall to the other. No, Corinth would only fall when the Union Army came down here and very carefully maneuvered around the landscape and dug holes and dug ditches uh, these earthworks are what Smith was talking about when you said you're going to have to dig a badger out of his hole. That means this will be a campaign of digging, a slow campaign of digging and uh, lower intensity of fighting. Uh, in order to get Corinth, we are going to have to dig the enemy out of Corinth. So General Halleck came down to take command of the army, so General Grant is once again on the outs made the uh, supernumerary second in command of the army and uh, General Halleck took over and starting on the 29th of April 1862 he began leading his army slowly across the landscape 22 miles from uh, from uh, Pittsburgh landing to, to Corinth and he took a month to cover that 22 miles and again it was a month it was almost a month after the battle, or at least three weeks after the battle, on the 29th of April, that Halleck commenced his march from Shiloh to, to Corinth. And uh, so very few, very few engagements occurred during that time that could be called battles. Uh, on the 9th of May, uh, the uh, Confederates tried to launch an attack from the east side of their fortification, fortifications in order to isolate and destroy a small Union force that had crossed Seven Mile Creek. Seven Mile Creek is a swampy creek east of town. Uh, and they, uh, they did catch the Union forces on the wrong side of Seven Mile Creek, 
But nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the trap that the Confederates set failed to close, and after a day of, uh, of pretty intense but uh, indecisive fighting, the Federals escaped back to the other side of Seven Mile Creek. That's called the, we call that the Battle of Farmington, or the engagement at Farmington. And there are several other uh, similar, similar engagements, but even smaller than that, all around, uh, all around these Confederate fortifications as General Halleck very slowly moved to encircle, to, to, to wrap his army around the Confederate fortifications. And there wasn't a day that went by that wherever the Union forces went, they did not stop and dig in. Every single day, they would stop and dig in, and quite a few times they would dig armed camps and then stay in them for three, four, five, or a week, days or a week, before, while, Alec, while Halleck planned the next grand movement of his army. In these days, we would call it an army group. Halleck now had three armies under his command, Grant's Previously, Grant's Army of the Tennessee, now under the command of General George Thomas, General Buell's Army of the Ohio, still under General Buell, and the Army of the Mississippi under uh, General John Pope, uh, which was on the left side. Named after the river. The Union armies were named after rivers, yes. Army of the Mississippi, Army of the Tennessee, and Army of the Ohio. And they got the Army of Tennessee, and boy, when I was a kid, did that confuse the heck out of me? The Confederate <laughs> Army of Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and Grant got demoted because he got surprised or something. Yeah, well, No, yeah. you know what that was all about? It was because Halleck was jealous of well, the Union Army. Well, but the once the siege is crazy. once the siege is underway, everything happens very slowly and very methodically. A lot of a lot of digging, a lot of skirmishing, and behind the Union lines, a lot of training. And the Union lines are mainly what we're going to be looked at today. So this program uh, to dig a badger out of its hole, we are going to look at the siege operations of one division of General Halleck's army along one axis of advance. And there are several, spa several spots we can visit here in Corinth where we can learn about the advance of General Sherman's division of General Grant's army uh, upon this position. Of course, General Sherman never fails to leave us all sorts of good material to write about and read about. And, and so, he, so this is going to be a good division to follow if you want to get some good stories to tell. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Now, uh, the logistics of our operation. Um, we're, going to, we're going to drive. Uh, so we're going to make a car caravan. I'm driving a silver Ford. So every time we stop, we're going to take, I'm going to, we're going to catch up behind each other and be good neighbors and good, uh, uh, good driving mates. And we're going to drive in a caravan uh, to the next stop. And there are going to be uh, one, two, three, four stops before we come back to the visitor set, to the Corinth interpreter set. Very quickly, the four stops will be the site of the engagement at Russell House, uh, an engagement that occurred on the 17th of May, 1862. The second will be uh, some Union earthworks uh, that, that were uh, saw action during the uh, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, all through the 28th of, of May. The third will be a, a place called, uh, that we call the Burns property, but it is a salient of the Confederate line of battle. So we're going to have a chance to see those Confederate earthworks on the Beauregard line that General Beauregard and his troops built. Actually, just General Beauregard's troops built them. He may have designed it, but the troops built them. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will drive on down to the crossroads so we can see those crossroads of the uh, 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 where the Tishomingo Hotel used to stand and where the, those two railroads cross. The objective of the campaign, the prize of the Battle of Shiloh. And we're going to talk a little bit like about that. So we're going to talk about General Sherman's operations. We're also going to talk before the end of the day about some strategic stuff when we get to the railroads and have a chance to talk about that. Okay, some warnings, <laughs> just so people know. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> it's supposed to be raining. 
<laughs> Every time we park our cars, we are going to walk from the cars to some place. So every time about a mile long of gravel road. And nobody knows the condition of that road at this time. They will. It's wet. It, it is wet. Yeah, we I could assume that it's wet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, we are going to be driving our vehicles, you know, right down muddy gravel roads, and then when we get out of them, we are going to be walking through that through that stuff. Uh, I do know that road, and I have every reason to believe that it will not eat our cars. <laughs> I'm not going to promise that, I'm but uh, I'm pretty confident we will get in and get out pretty, uh, uh, pretty easily. Uh, although we'll keep our eyes below us to make sure that we don't get into any mud holes. Um, and then we'll get back here and wrap it up in the afternoon. Uh, so, uh, are we ready to go? Okay, well then, uh, no first stop, let's get to our cars. I'm going to get my gray Ford and just park down there by the stop sign. And then when we're all... Uh, I'll race you guys. When we're all... Easy. Well, that's it. It's slipping down here. Now I remember that right there, the turret looking thing. That's our goal, the top of that hill. I guess we said you couldn't park on the side of this little dinky road. So, cross over and we walk along to the top of that hill. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so uh, about uh, halfway on this drive that we just made, uh, must be somewhere five to four or five miles from the intersection, we passed, we passed through where the Confederate main line of battle was, the earthworks. They're not going to defend Corinth at the earthworks at first. Uh, uh, doctrine would dictate that they would build the earthworks as the last line of defense, and then once the earthworks were built, they would send troops out to occupy outposts, and that these outposts would be the first lines where they would resist the Union the Union advance. So, why was there an outpost at Russell House? By standing on this high ground, we can look around and we can see. First of all, to the west. We know to the west there is a railroad. And it's pretty close to where we are. We can't see it right now, but the railroad is just off over here. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the location of Russell House? Uh, Russell House is about 500 yards okay. that direction. Right. Um, and, and so Russell House stands up on top of a high ridge. In front of that ridge is Phillips Creek. Phillips Creek runs right, uh, rises up over there, runs through here, and then cuts across the front of the Union line of battle over there. So Phillips Creek provides the Confederates a good natural barrier to try to keep the Federals on the other side of it. So that creek is important. Phillips Creek, the railroad. The high hill, and then another high open hill there that if the Federals move on top of the hill, the Confederates can see it from here. And also, if the Federals move off that hill to the west and try to move through the bottom of Phillips Creek, first they'll have to deal with Phillips Creek, it's muddy, and two, they'll see them from here. So this outpost will be able to send back word to the Confederate commanders, uh, Chalmers and, and Bragg and Beauregard, that the Yankees are moving to the west, trying to get to the railroad. There's an outpost to the east of Russell House, an outpost to the west of Russell House. The next outpost to the rest, to the west of here, is called Bowie Hill or Bowie Cut. And it is where the railroad cuts through, basically cuts through this ridge. This ridge does continue on to the west. And, uh, and where the railroad cuts through um, that ridge is an area called Bowie Cut, and there was an outpost there. Later, in the later parts of the siege, the Federals managed to get an outpost all the way over to the east side of Bowie Cut, and the Confederate cavalry of Ward Adams Mississippi Regiment were still camped on the west side of Bowie Cut. And so we had one of those instances where the Yankees and the Rebels were fraternizing and commiserating, you know, just shouting at each other across the railroad, uh, you know, come and get us if you can, and, or meet us in the middle and we'll trade tobacco for newspapers or whatever you got. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So, that's the nature of why, of what's, of why there's going to be a battle on this hill. It's an important Confederate outpost. The Confederate outpost is important because it gives a wonderful view shed of the area, of an area that the Federals are going to have to cross at some point. And so they'll get warning. Furthermore, when the Federals come up here, the purpose of the outpost is to make it strong enough that they're going to have to fight for it. So strong enough that uh, uh, Halleck or whoever is over there, it's going to be Sherman, uh, is going to have to really send his forces across here, take the hill, and then bring his division up here to capture it. So the overall doctrine of General Halleck's advance so conservative, we don't fight battles. So conservative, we advance and we dig in. Uh, General Sherman could have come up there three, four, five days in a row and said, "General Halleck, let me take the uh, let me take the hill." Actually, he would ask General Thomas, and then General Thomas would ask, ask General Halleck, "General Thomas, let me take the hill." No, you gotta wait. Okay, maybe tomorrow. They go down the other side. Finally, on the 17th of May, General Halleck felt like he had his army ready to move. On the 17th of May, General Halleck said the whole movie, the whole army will move forward all the way from the left. General Pope's army all the way to the right. Uh, General Thomas's army of the Tennessee and on the right of General Thomas's army of the Tennessee is General Sherman's division. To the rear of the right 
of General Sherman's division is another Union division called the Reserve Division, General John McClernand commanding that one. But as far as westward facing, this is just about the left flank of the Union Army on the morning of the 17th of May, 1862. On that morning, the whole of General Halleck's army lurched forward. They moved out of their encampments and they marched forward and they threw out clouds of skirmishers and they started to move forward all along the line. Sherman made his march of about a mile and a half until he got to the top of this next hill. Then he deployed skirmishers and he brought up, uh, uh, brought up uh, uh, one of his brigades, a brigade under the command of General Morgan L. Smith. To the west, he sent another brigade under the command of General J.W. Denver, some artillery with that. So these two brigades on the 17th would have been lined up on the top of that hill. And the Confederates in Russell House, uh, at the Russell House outpost, would have been dug in, in and around the buildings of Russell House. Ready to, ready to make anybody that came up the hill fight for it. General Sherman deployed some artillery and started trying to soften up the uh, position with artillery. Then after they'd done that for a while, uh, General Sherman sent forward his skirmishers. Actually, General Smith, Morgan Smith, sent forward his skirmishers, a cloud of skirmishers uh, comprising the 8th Missouri Regiment. The 8th Missouri Regiment, which had previously been commanded by... Uh, uh, Morgan Smith when he was a colonel. So they were a regiment that he really understood and trusted, the St. Louis Regiment. And, uh, and so the 8th Missouri came down into that low ground, had to work their way across Phillips Creek and start to fight their way up uh, this hill. Once they started coming up the hill, they would have come under fire from the Confederates on top of the hill. Confederates deployed all the way across here, usually in skirmish formation, and usually dug in the rifle pits. Uh, so firing from cover. Following the skirmishers, a, uh, a reserve, a reserve that would be uh, ready, that once the skirmishers developed the defensive position, the reserve to break through the skirmishers in close order, elbow to elbow, bayonets, you know, fixed if that's what they needed to do, to charge up and over and take the position. And that reserve was made up of the 55th Illinois Regiment. Some of us might remember them from that fight with Stewart's Brigade in, uh, at the Battle of Shiloh. Some of us might, might remember the 8th Missouri from Wallace's division at the Battle of Shiloh. So uh, the 8th Missouri came on up and they fought their way up the hill. And now this is not like the Battle of Shiloh, elbow to elbow, blasting each other in the face. It's a skirmish fighting. They called it Indian fighting. You know, in a loose formation, dodging from cover to cover, hiding behind this uh, this tree stump or that log. You know, one person shooting while another advances, uh, crawling on their bellies, stuff like that. So the 8th Missouri worked their way to the top of the hill, uh, and then finally, uh, once they're at the top of the hill, there's a very sharp firefight for the buildings of the Russell Farm itself. The Confederates took uh, the Mississippians. Uh, took refuge inside the farm buildings and fired from the windows and from the porch and, and cover behind the building. Uh, the Missourians peppered that building with musket balls uh, for a long time until finally they made a rush at the building and as they kicked in the doors and bounded into the building, the last of the Confederate skirmishers were escaping through the back door and headed back down the other side of the hill. Uh, I seem to recall at least one story about one particularly aggressive and abusive Mississippian who, as the Missourians were coming up, was out in the dooryard of the, of the Russell House sort of cursing the Yankees and firing at them. And, and one of the Yankees drew a beat on him and he got him. He dropped that guy right in the dooryard of, of the Russell House. Um, Confederates headed on back down, retreated on back down retreated back to their next position. Uh, as a uh, follow-up to that, when Smith attacked this hill, Denver, uh, General James W. Denver, with four brigades, uh, with four regiments of Ohio troops, attacked the next hill and also brought up a battery of Illinois artillery. They were able to take that hill without opposition. And then they dug in their artillery and once the victory was won, 
once the Confederates had attacked, and Denver was over here, and Smith was entrenched here, Smith was here, Sherman got his orders, stop and entrench. And at that point, late in the afternoon of May 17th, Halleck stopped the whole army, declared victory, and they began to entrench. And thus ended the great offensive of May 17th, where General Halleck managed to lurch his army two miles closer to Corinth, but still two miles from the outer, the main uh, earthworks of Corinth. Yeah, yeah, total total casualties uh, ran in a couple of dozen. The 8th Missouri took some hits. Uh, the 55th Illinois took a couple of hits, and then the Mississippians left some of their guys here. But as far as the Army is concerned, no. Uh, the entire Army, uh, the entire division of 6,000 men marching forward, the only contact was here. The men who did the fighting had a really hard day. Everyone else marched forward, stopped, waited for orders, and then began digging in. And here they stayed for several more days. All right, let's let this car pass us. This will cross the street, head back to our cars, and before we leave from the next stop, I'll give us instructions on, on the next one. But as you notice, we were in about four miles along that road. It's called Polk Road uh, um, in uh, Corinth. We're gonna head back along that same axis. Everything we do will be on that road. And the next one, the next stop will be right at that stop sign, that intersection of the wind group. We'll go through the stop sign, through it, or left, you'll see signs. But we'll talk about this again when we get to our car. Did, the, did Sherman or McClernand or any of those other more aggressive guys complain about all, yeah. and what they're doing? all day long? <laughs> oh. It was the most frustrating, it was the most frustrating experience for any of these guys. The old brains, Halleck. Lincoln must have been going crazy with the other guy. Oh, he didn't know. He was just wanted to march around all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good old way. Yeah, yeah they're fighting. This is the guy who'll expend a, a Herculean amount of energy to build a molehill. <laughs> but he would keep the casualties low. <laughs> Russell House, we've been on the high ground over here and constantly expanding west toward the railroad. Google Earth it. You'll get to stay dry. You'll get to stay dry while we do while we look at the uh, while we get wet. follow the walk. Uh, the point here really is to get a look at some of the earthworks, some of the existing Union earthworks. And uh, we'll stop once or twice just to talk a little bit about the men who built them and, and the engagements around here. Uh, but then basically going to make a loop and come back to the cars and talk again and then uh, head on down to the Confederate earthworks. Okay? Earthworks. <laughs> the earthworks built by the Union troops after that event on the 17th, uh, several days after it. This was a position, I believe, that was manned by uh, General Thomas Davies, Union Division, and uh, and uh, he had worked his way forward conservatively, like everyone else did, from. That hill over here down to the little ground to this hill, and then they dug in again. If you look back in this direction and imagine the prolongation of those earthworks that are across the hill and across the road, cut off that intersection, that's a corner that we just went through, and then go up onto the next hill over there, 
and there you will be on the hill, um, the hill to Sherman's right that General Denver took on the 17th of, of May, and where General Sherman's division then came up and built a new entrenched camp. And then they waited at least a week, and it was the week of, uh, say, May 24th and 28th, before the next uh, round of action began. But whenever there is action going on, that doesn't mean that there's no action going on on the other day. All the time that Davies men are building these earthworks, uh, they need to send patrols out ahead. Those patrols need to dig, uh, uh, dig rifle pits. So they go out at night and they come in in the morning, and any time uh, Anytime they have a chance to snipe at the head of a Confederate that's sticking up on the other side, they'll do that. And anytime the Confederates have a chance to pick off one of Davies' men, they will try to do that. The earthworks are the main line of defense, and there's the outpost further ahead. Um, and so, they actually, if anybody's going to do some sniping, they're going to do it from out there. But if the Confederates decide to attack, they are covered. Right. And uh, and you can't see too many of them right now. Right now, you're looking at the main line of earthworks, what we call or the main line of earthworks. Uh, but earthworks like these, they're always going to go for a while, then they're going to have a traverse. They're going to bend back. Earthworks will bend back to protect the flank, and then eventually you might extend it again and then build another traverse and another traverse and another traverse. So they weren't just a wall in front of the camp. They were a very intricate maze of earthworks that really stitched this ground all the way around. What's left now is the great big uh, main uh, main entrenchment, which obviously was much much taller and much higher at the time. Now let's move on around the, the trail, and by the time we're about to finish, we'll get a good view of the scene of action uh, on the next day, on the next flight. <laughs> Arrow. Uh, we're going to go to this Confederate bastion next. Um, and so this section we're looking at right now is this right here. Yeah, I think we're right here where it says, yeah, the, yeah. where the word Davies right. appears. Yeah. And you stretch a little bit more and you pick up some more. Right, okay. right. All right, let's continue on around.
possibly we're down and then back up There would have been earthworks further north, and then again, here. And this, this extension would have been between here and that barn. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, probably between here and that barn, and then uh, on top of that hill. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just below it, so it's going to be hard to see better than the peak. All right. As, as the sign showed us, these, this sign over here says it as well, these are seed lines that were built between May 21 and 28, 1864. The Battle of Russell House, as, a, as you'll recall, was the 17th of May. So that was one lurch forward. Uh, the next lurch forward on the 21st brought the Army to this line. And as Mona was pointing out, you know, these earthworks, if we had followed the earthworks, they would have cut right over this hill and across the way. They would have cut the corner of the intersection and gone up to the top of the hill there. And this was Davies' division, and Sherman's division was the division up there. Now, the 21st to the 28th was a, a crucial time in the uh, uh, in the the siege of Corinth. As obviously, Sherman moved not only uh, they didn't only move south toward the earthworks; they moved more west toward the railroads and the railroad, and thus thus tightening the noose on the Confederates. And so the Confederates needed to start fighting harder every time um, every time Sherman lurched forward. And so this, this dip here, high ground here and high ground over there, this dip at that time was an open field, and an open field that was covered by Confederate fire uh, on the you look through those trees and it goes up a hill on that hill was a double log house uh, that gets referred to many times in the reports about that time uh, the confederates would use that double log house as a as an outpost and if federal pickets got too close to it the confederates would fight them and shoot them and so uh, i don't know on which day it was but once the federals got up here after the 21st and got themselves dug in they brought up artillery and they just pounded that double log house until there was nothing left for the Confederates to hide in. Uh, they just they just broke that thing into in the matchstick. And then on more than one occasion, uh, General Sherman moved men into this area and they encountered resistance. And then, according to Halleck's doctrine, they had to pull back. On the 28th of May, uh, General uh, Halleck organized another grand push. The whole army would lurch forward. And on the 28th, the army lurched lurch forward again, and Sherman sent at least one of his brigades, James Denver's, uh, across that field, but then also brought up, again, it was Morgan Smith's uh, brigade right along the road. And Smith came along the road behind Denver, and as I understand, he appears to have come along in column of march, so that Smith could very quickly move to one side or the other, or help, you know, move to some po point in the battlefield. And again, the, the battle was very uh, of a lower intensity than Shiloh. It was whenever the line of battle could find just a fo any fold in the ground, it would hide them, they would go down, and then they would start clawing at the dirt with the bayonets and their and their cups and their coffee cups and building up a, a barricade in front of them and uh, eventually they they maneuvered the confederates out of their outposts and then moved on to the next outpost until finally uh, by the end of the 28th uh, general halleck's army was up against the main line of confederate earthworks uh, they were very close to it. So for our next stop, that is where we're going to go. We're going to go to the main line of Confederate earthworks. So how we're going to do it is this. I believe there's an exit over here. I'm going to get in the front, turn left on 20, and then immediately turn left again on Polk Road. We're going to head down Polk Road. I believe it's two or three miles. And then there's a sign similar to that one on the right side of the road that says Confederate earthworks. And I'm going to pull in there, and as soon as I pull in there, there's a gate that's locked. So I'm going to have to get out of my car, and I'm going to have to open the gate, and then we're going to be able to get in. So those of you who are further behind might need to pull over, 
you know, two tires off the road, put on your blinkers uh, so, that the, so that the locals don't smash into the back of you. And then once the gate is open, we'll all move back in there. I'll close the gate again. I won't lock it, but I'll, you know, close the gate again. And then I'll get back in my car, and then we'll go on down to the Confederate Bastion. Make sense? Yeah. All right, let's do that. Sherman uh, was there. Bert's house is what we call the double log house. I told you that story of Confederate skirmishers there, so between Davies and Sherman, they could concentrate their fire on that house and just knock it down. So they had been working their way south and west until finally they're going to cut the railroad here is going to be one more piece of bad news for the Confederates. Now what we're going to do is go back to the Confederate main line of resistance. Thus far, all of the, con the Confederate resistance has been on outposts. Uh, the, they, they're working on that main line of resistance and they're building it here and making it impregnable if it's attacked, but they don't want to be attacked in it. They want to keep the Federals at arm le arm's length and fight them out here. And uh, as far as not fighting is concerned, you know, Halleck is, is perfectly willing to uh, oblige them in, in that. Halleck is about digging and maneuvering. So we're going to head on back, and we've come in this, the road was essentially here, and we came in about there. We drove up here, here's the, this section of the earthwork, and we're going to walk in, and this bastion is what we're going to to visit. You can see it comes up over here, it would have been built up over here. At one point it was the farthest north of the Confederate line. Uh, it's jutting out to take advantage of a hillside. Um, and then it cut back to cut back across the railroad and then ultimately terminate well to the north and the west in earthworks over here that were later used, defended by Union soldiers in October 1862, when Confederates attacked under Van Dorn attacked from this area. So the Confederates never used these earthworks, but these earthworks were used against the Confederates when they attacked in 1862. And if outpost defense, was that just to buy time? I mean, it doesn't seem to make much sense. As a, as well, that goes to what Beauregard was supposed to be doing. Beauregard was compelled to protect Corinth at all costs. So buying time was was part of that uh, part of that calculation until such time as he could convince Richmond that he would not defend uh, Corinth at all costs. We'll talk about that a little bit. Right, but the output, yeah, buy time, delay, delay, delay. By the time the Federals are up against the main line of resistance, they're going to get around the end, and that'll be it anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. But something good might have happened in between, like when oh, Holly Springs fell in the big time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, yeah, I, if you recall uh, a little while ago, I said if uh, General Halleck could have advanced his army to within six feet of the main line of resistance, he would have ordered it to attack three feet and, and trench again. Well, that's about where we are right now. Uh, we have reached the, the ditch, and this is the ditch of the northernmost salient of what's known as the Beauregard Line. And uh, behind it, if it can be taken, there would be uh, nothing. nothing between this and, and the crossroads. And of course, the Confederate camps and so on. And so this is, this is the earthwork that they spent the most, uh, the most time and the energy on. Now, <clears throat> the Confederates did have access to a labor supply that the Federals did not. And so the handiwork you're looking at right now is the handiwork uh, largely, uh, to some extent, of enslaved people who were, uh, 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 you know, the, the army would try to hire them from local plantation owners, and then the slave men would come and they'd throw up the dirt and, and uh, the Confederate engineers would do the engineering. Which is not to say that the Confederate infantrymen did not dig and work on these uh, these earthworks, they certainly did. It was a matter of all hands uh, between the Confederate infantrymen and the hired uh, hired slave labor. Now, with, on that point, Beauregard probably encountered something that many other Confederate commanders encountered when they were in desperate situations and needed uh, uh, needed local landowners and plantation owners to hire out their slaves. To the government, uh, and that was a lack of trust by those property owners of the government. Uh, you know, you said you were gonna, you said you were gonna pay me for the use of my slaves, and my slaves built an earthwork for you, and you never paid. So what are you gonna do next time? And what more? Two of them died while you, they were building your earthworks, and, uh, and I lost all of this money. Uh, that, that's not a quote. Of, <laughs> that's not a quote, but. By all means, that is a, a, a that is a uh, economic negotiation that uh, can't, that occurred many times between the Confederate military and confed and slave owning Confederate uh, civilians who were called upon to uh, uh, to contribute their slaves labor to the cause of the Confederacy. Um, but nevertheless. Uh, uh, Slave labor did contribute to the building of the Beauregard line, along with the day-to-day -day labor of the infantry. They all had to chip in, uh, but of course the infantry also had the job of rotating in and out to the outposts and manning those outposts and possibly trying to, possibly having to fight with, fight with Yankees at one time or another, defending those outposts. Um, stop and listen. What do we hear? That's the train. On the train, on the same train tracks that were being defended by this, and, and this bastion does. This is, like I said, this is the four, northernmost bastion. So it, it came from that direction, from south and east, and now it bends back in this direction to south and west, where it will cross the railroad. As you can hear, probably in less than a mile, maybe half a mile from where we are standing. Now let's look at the entrenchment. Of course you have earth piled right here. As you look at the illustration, see if earth, the earth would be backed by logs. The logs would be backed, braced at each link. And then the earth dug out of the ditch and piled against the logs. Behind there they're going to build some fire steps and we're probably going to see when we go around. Um, and as it bends back, it changes the direction of the line, so if Federals come around here, they cannot flank it. Um, but in any case, what this particular position creates, what's known as a salient, uh, it sticks out on three sides. Mm -hmm. And if the Federals had ever gotten close enough to concentrate their fire on it, this would be a really bad place for a Confederate to be posted because uh, they would have had uh, artillery fire coming on them from three sides. It never came to that in this case. Uh, but all the way up past May 28, when they fought that battle, 
back there by the double log house and came through there. Uh, up through May 30th, uh, the Federals again prepared another lurch forward against this. Uh, and the, the date scheduled uh, for the big lurch came and on, in the night before the attack, uh, the Federals were, all up, were up all night long listening to um, uh, an unaccountable sound coming from down in Corinth. And that is the sound of trains coming and going. Uh, men that had worked in the railroads told their comrades the arriving trains are empty and the departing trains are full. Uh, and they tried to send the word up to the generals and the generals were, they had a plan and they were going to do the plan. It didn't matter what the privates had to, had to say about it. Uh, just before dawn, a series of explosions, a series of huge explosions rocked the ground. And as dawn came up, the word came to make the attack. And they, it certainly Sherman's division made the attack in this area. And the skirmishers out front, preceding the lines of battle, came across, the, oh, this is all obviously all cleared out at the time, not, not uh, trees at all, came across this landscape, came up against this fort, came up against this bastion in the twinkling light of dawn, and at some point, they lay down, they turned to each other, some lieutenant said, follow me, <laughs> and it was up into the ditch, and over to find the Confederates were gone. Uh, the Confederates had evacuated the position and then the line of battle came rolling over this bastion that the Confederates had spent so much uh, time and effort on. Um, the Federals just walked right in. Let's walk around, there's another, uh, uh, there's another interpretive wayside on the other side, so let's walk around and take a look at that before we head back to our cars. Yeah. Can I ask yes. you something before we Mona? move this point? Yeah. Over here, it looks like there's two. I think there are, yeah. Like a double layer? Yeah, Six and two. I think there's an apron, uh, what they would have called an apron. This mm -hmm. is the bastion. I think they would have called an apron that, oh, yeah. uh, uh, that reached out. And in fact, on the I don't know exactly which way is due west right now, but when we looked at the map right before we walked in, you could see there was a, a red line where the bastion was made, and then the Confederates had built an apron that went due west mm -hmm. from the bastion to the railroad, and then the main line continued on, con continued on to the south and the west. So, yeah, they, this is absolutely an outwork mm -hmm. of the bastion, and it might have been occupied if they intended to, and I don't know which direction is due west, but due west from the bastion, okay. it's that one. Yeah, due west from the bastion. Uh, there was an earthwork, an apron that went straight to the um, to the railroad. Okay. But yeah, I, I don't I don't think that was on the map that we saw. I don't think so. But this it is what you think it is. That is an, an outwork of the yeah, bathroom. I didn't see that on the map. Mm -hmm. Be careful stepping over this mud puddle. Yeah. That's a slippery.
now inside the battery, and this is the point of view during the siege of the Confederates. And then if you read the uh, interpretive sign, you see in October of 1864, this was manned by some badgers of the 12th Wisconsin Battery. Uh, and during the, uh, during the Battle of Corinth in October, this was beyond the eastern flank of the combat, um, but not by too much. Um, yeah, and the position was threatened on the left flank by the attacking Confederate Army, but proved untenable. And then the Federals abandoned it in the defenses, um, when the Union defenses were overrun on the 3rd. Uh, so on the 3rd, it was briefly, 3rd of October, it was briefly manned by the, by the Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, but yeah. it was built for them by the, uh, by the Confederates in April and May right. of 1862. Now, General Halleck, you're kind of mixing, you're kind of mixing your battles there. Yeah, mixing our battles. Yeah, yeah. We got yeah. May and October all, all, in, all wrapped into one. Yeah. Uh, but hey, the same pile of dirt got used by the same, by different people at different times. Um, now, General Halleck, uh, obviously, his army, General Halleck took a, took possession of Corinth after the Confederates evacuated, but. Uh, I think some of the uh, Confederate privates used to like to joke that they had been, uh, they had actually been uh, beaten by a general disability. <laughs> and uh, because the, uh, the landscape and the, the, the natural landscape around Corinth is, is not in, at all inviting to a large army to be camped here. Uh, it is Obviously, by the time uh, May gets around and into June, things are getting very hot down here. Uh, this is an area with a lot of low-lying, swampy areas, so uh, a lot of a lot of bugs and a lot of mosquitoes. Very difficult for them to get clean water. Uh, one of the things they found they could dig down, 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 and the water that would come up from the wells, uh, four wells would simply be this filthy brackish stuff, often often white, uh, possibly, you know, in, sort of infected with uh, crushed shells, lime, essentially lime, you know. And uh, this was the stuff they had to drink, or they found themselves having to drink out of uh, stagnant pools and ponds. And so, even while the Confederates were building this enormous fort, the Confederates who were to defend it were going down one after another with uh, dysentery and typhoid fever and uh, bug-borne, uh, various bug-borne maladies such as malaria, mm -hmm. uh, which their surgeons at the time did not know what it was and what caused it. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought it was caused by bad smells, thus the name of, of the disease, malaria. Um, they didn't know about the, the mosquitoes. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, all the time, Sherman and Halleck and Grant and all the rest are turning the screws, turning the levers, and tightening uh, the grip on Corinth, the ability of the Confederate infantry to defend the forts that they had built uh, was declining. And certainly by the 30th of May, uh, there was, they were not able to um, you know, if, if they sensed the Federals were going to make a major attack against these forts, Beauregard certainly sensed that he, his men would not be able to successfully defend them. And they pulled out and they evacuated. Uh, so if we had more time, we're going to head back to our, to our, uh, our cars. But if you ever have time to come out here on your own, there are trails that go all around here. You can see all of the earthworks that were dug uh, almost all of, almost as far as the railroad, um, but uh, and uh, they're pretty impressive you know, where they where they are right now. We have some pretty good, pretty well preserved earthworks here, uh, so it's a great place to come and visit when you're in Corinth. Mm -hmm. Normally, you'll need to get a, a ranger to come out here with you, as you know it ha it's locked up, um, and so someone need to bring you here. But you can walk walk back. You can walk back. Is, yeah. Is it parkland? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. It does, yeah, it does belong to the national park. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair walk. Yeah, but yeah, they don't. To get your car back, you're gonna have to let them unlock it for you. 
All right, let's walk on back to the uh, parking lot. How many rocks do you get with Mysterio? <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. I need to get a picture. There we go. Now, uh, yeah, there's been some talk about what Beauregard had on his mind um, in the days leading up to the evacuation and uh, whether he intended to defend Corinth. Uh, the, uh, the appearance is that he knew he could not defend Corinth, no matter what his intentions might have been. Uh, yet he was under orders. He was under orders to hold the city. But you can see the way his mind and his reasoning is working. Late in May, uh, he wrote a letter to uh, Jefferson Davis's uh, military advisor, General Robert E. Lee, in Richmond. Remember, this is before May 31st. Joe Johnson is still in charge of the Confederate Army in the East. He's not going to get shot in the neck till uh, May 31st at Fair Oaks. Um, so Beauregard wrote a letter to Robert E. Lee and fr through Robert E. Lee to Jefferson Davis. And the first thing he did was uh, assure Jefferson Davis that, yes, of course, uh, Corinth will be held. It will be defended and will be held, and those Yankees are never going to get it. Um, uh, yet, if the worst scenario happens and it has to be evacuated, here's what I'll do. And then he laid out a whole plan, a very careful plan of evacuation, saying, uh, you know, of course we will never do this, but generally here's how I'm going to evacuate if it ever comes to it. Uh, pretty much by the time Lee was opening that letter, the Confederate Army was evacuating uh, Corinth and uh, heading down toward Tupelo. Uh, it, it, took, um, it took some time uh, first to get the, the wounded out and to get what supplies they could out, uh, but finally by the, uh, by the morning of the 30th of, of May, the last of the Confederates were marching out and the last of the supplies that could not be evacuated uh, were put to light and that included some uh, ordnance stores right down here in the area where we are now. So those explosions that the Federals heard before dawn on May 30th that shook the ground were uh, ordnance supplies in this area set alight by the retreating Confederates. And so by the time uh, Halleck's men had scrambled over those earthworks and realized that the Confederates were gone, and then it was... Uh, a race, a race, hightailing it. Who is going to be the first one to the crossroads? Who is going to be the first one to stick a flag at that railroad crossroads? And uh, I, I'm not going to discuss that particular controversy because they never agreed. So we're, not, is, we're not going to solve it now. Uh, but uh, needless to say, uh, it, for us, that takes on great symbolism. Imagine all of these Yankees racing to the crossroads. Who's, which general will be the first one to put his flag in the crossroads that we came up the Tennessee River, we uh, fought the Battle of Shiloh, we won the Battle of Shiloh, we killed Sidney Johnson, we uh, marched across these lands, we besieged Corinth, we outdug Beauregard, and finally we've captured the crossroads. Yay! <laughs> the war is over! <laughs> just like we planned. <laughs> of course, the war was not over. And in fact, if the, if the Tennessee River yeah. campaign had, uh, uh, if it was filled with great results for the Union, which it was, uh, the, it, it knocked Tennessee out of the Confederacy. Uh, it it, uh, Lincoln said we must have we would like to have God on our side but we must have Kentucky and the Tennessee River campaign solidified Kentucky in Union control for the rest of the war notwithstanding a Quixotic endeavor by General Bragg 
in October of 1862 uh, to go back to Kentucky. No, there were a lot of great things were accomplished uh, by that Tennessee River campaign. But if we go back to that meeting of General Halleck and General Sherman uh, in St. Louis, where they profoundly laid out the map and General Halleck said to General, uh, General Sherman, General Sherman, what is the true? What is the true line of advance? And General General Sherman said it's Corinth. A stab right Corinth. into the heart of the Confederacy. They must die. He didn't pronounce it Corinth. He probably pronounced it Corinth. I don't know. Um, well, they did that. And it had enormous amounts of good effects. But if they thought it was going to end the war, they were wrong. And General Grant admitted as much. Uh, after when he wrote his memoirs, he said, after Shiloh, I knew that this war would not end until one side or the other was totally defeated. Uh, and what he was, you know, not saying at the same time was this war would never end by uh, the trickery of Napoleonic strategy of planting a flag on a spot in the map and having the enemy throw up their hands and say, Uncle, you beat me. You caught the crossroads. Until next time. Um, so uh, that brings us to the end of our program here. And I want to get back to the Interpretive Center right away and give them their key because they can't go home until they have the key. So let's okay. not be late for that. But I... I'm more than willing to do some Q&A, and we can and meet there in the Interpretive Center, center and, uh, and, and chat I bring, some more. I got some Wisconsin cherry cola if anybody wants And <laughs> and, and Badger Jim has some Wisconsin cherry cola for us. I do it every year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's mount up and head back to the Interpretive Center. Yeah. Is there you anybody ever, that have wants sprinkers? to follow me, or do we all you kind never of had a Are you sure you're from Wisconsin? You, well, you, you drink cola. I've had other Sprecher pops. They make a good root beer too. Yeah, I don't drink. They make a good root beer float with Sprecher cherry cola. No, no, no. I call it my arthritis medicine. The cherry juice is good for arthritis. Okay. And this got real cherry juice. My 25 year old Randy spoke to my phone one time while I was going to do a makeup of my arthritis medicine. Yeah. Okay.